everybody in Bregenz Body Path Group and uh, especially Claudia and all the, the members. Uh, it's uh, I'm really sorry that I can't be with you there in the beautiful city of Bregenz. I really was looking forward to it very much to return after two years. But anyway, I think with some good blessing from the Dharma protectors and so on, uh, I should be able to come there directly uh, in person before too long. But in the meantime, uh, we decided that it would still be useful to do something. And therefore here, where I'm staying right now in Sakhidechenling in, in Stuttgart, we decided uh, uh, to, to do this uh, kind of short streaming event uh, as Claudia had requested. So tonight the topic is uh, meditation in turbulent times. I mean, actually, when are times not turbulent, we could say. But uh, okay, so nowadays, right now, it feels a little strange. So perhaps the topic is well suited for this time. So what we're going to do actually is begin with a little meditation actually and uh, we'll meditate together for a short while and then after that I'll give some kind of talk, general talk about the purpose of meditation, how we understand that in the Buddhist tradition and what use it can be right uh, now for us all. So Firstly, to, to do some meditation, I think it's, we always believe that it's nice to, to begin that by reciting some short verse uh, in which we, as we put it in Buddhism, we take refuge in the three jewels of the Buddha, uh, his teaching, and the Sangha, the community of Buddha's disciples. And uh, this, in a way, gives us a great connection, true, a reconnection, perhaps one could say, to the source of all kind of wisdom and all goodness, which is none other than actually the Buddha nature that exists, we think, in all beings. And then also in this short verse, we will make like a, the aspiration that through whatever practice we do, in this case meditation, that we actually achieve that state of being a source of complete benefit and, and happiness for all beings that state which is known as the state of being a Buddha. So I will chant this short uh, preliminaries, and then after that we should sit in silence. Now if you're not familiar with, although I think almost certainly you all are, if you're not familiar with how to rest the mind during this short period of meditation, then just concentrate a little bit on your breathing, because this is such a great stabilizer for us in, in, in beginning to to meditate. There's nothing fancy, nothing complicated, uh, nothing extraordinarily difficult. All, human, all sentient beings breathe, actually. So, once with the body at least. So, we need to just tune into our breathing. And one very good way to do that is to count to ourselves, to count mentally. And that, by which I mean, as we breathe out, and it's just natural breathing. It's not some special kind of control breathing, just ordinary breathing. As we breathe out, first time we think to ourselves, one, and then when we breathe out again, naturally, two, and so on, up to 21. When you get to 21, you can pause for a minute, and then, oh, I mean a short while, not actually literally a minute, or maybe just a moment, in fact, and then start the counting again. Now, if during that time of, counting and following your breath, many thoughts come up. Don't be surprised, of course they will. You're not a completely enlightened yogin right now, at least I know I'm not, maybe you are. But so thoughts and emotions will arise. Gently note them and carry on with the counting. If they're so kind of strong that you forget where you're up to, just return again to one. It's not a race, it's not a competition to be the most control, have the most controlled mind on the planet, but it's a way of just bringing ourselves back into the present moment, which is actually where meditation really begins. So let's, let's do that to begin with. So first I'll do the, the verse of refuge and bodhicitta, and then we'll sit together through the magic of electronic media, <laughs> 
the illusory play <laughs> of electronic media, we will meditate to, together for a short while and then I'll continue with some short explanations. Sanjay Chodan Sanjay Chodan Janju Badu Dani Chapsuji Tagi Jinzo Jibe Sanamji Rola Pinji Sanjay Rupa Sanjay Chodan Sanjay Chodan Janju Badu Dani Chapsuji Tagi Jinzo Jibe Sanamji Brola Pinji Sanji Drupa Sanji Chidong Suji Chonamba Chanju Badu Dani Chap Suji Dagi Jinzo Jibe Sanamji Brola Pinji Sanji Drupa Golden Savi Lama Rimboji Lagi Ju Pemi Dishula Kadin Chemu Gune Jesunde Kusundu Jinu Drusel
Okay, let's let's um, close the meditation for now. Yes, yeah, so the the actual topic is, uh, as I mentioned already, meditation for turbulent times. Uh, actually, in the Buddha's Dharma and Buddha's teachings, um, we yes teach a lot about meditation uh, as part of the the path to to happiness and uh, to freedom from suffering, and to actually the development of the qualities of wisdom and compassion. Um, so really, in a way, one could say Buddhism is about happiness. Uh, in a sem simple sense, it is. Actually, all beings are looking for happiness when we, when we really come down to it. Everybody in the world wants to be happy, and everybody wants to be free from suffering. It's impossible to find anybody, not just humans, of course, but other creatures too want these same things happiness and freedom from suffering. Right now, of course, uh, the world is uh, in some difficulties, it, it, it seems, and uh, so people, as well as this, we could say looking for stability and security. Of course, these are forms of happiness and freedom from suffering, um, but it's a particular kind of uh, unstable time, and this can add to the general kind of emotional and the mental suffering that people carry with them alongside their physical sufferings when they arise. So there's much to be concerned about, one could say, and therefore need to, to, to really find the best resources to, to deal with these times. But still it goes back to this question, how to attain happiness and how to be free from suffering. If we look at the kind of the world itself, the history of the world, and so on, we could say that people have tried all kinds of ways to achieve these two goals of happiness and freedom from suffering. And we might begin by divining them, those, their search up into two different types of searches, or two different types of belief, one might say, or assumption. One is that one way to attain happiness is to control the external world to find a means of controlling our environment, the world around us, uh, which might include our body, in fact, for, for that uh, matter, and therefore to, to find the maximum kind of happiness by that means, and the maximum freedom from suffering. And in fact, uh, such, a, such an attempt to, to, to gain happiness and freedom from suffering by controlling, maybe changing, uh, regulating the external world has led to some happiness. One must actually uh, acknowledge that. The wonderful discoveries in science and medicine and so on have really brought a uh, great uh, benefit to, to humankind. Uh, and it would be really utterly foolish to not to acknowledge that. Uh, in fact, the present circumstance brings it home to us how important medicine is. And along with that, also one might count, you know, the attempts to regulate society, to, to change society and kind of dysfunctions in society to, to, again, to kind of lead to a kind of happier life for people and freedom from, from unhappiness and, and, and suffering. So those are all good. And, and where they truly have, uh, you know, they're good in the sense of where they've truly led to improvements in happiness and freedom from suffering, one must, must really appreciate that. But still, from a Dharma point of view, and not just Dharma, but actually many philosophies and religious systems would say this is not enough. That this control of the external world, control of the physical world, is not enough to lead to uh, the actual ultimate happiness, the ultimate freedom from suffering. Because there's more to us as human beings, in fact, there's more to us sentient beings, than just the merely physical circumstances in which we find ourselves. There's a whole dimension of our humanity which goes beyond that. And so I would suggest that it's philosophies, certain philosophies and religious philosophies, perhaps one might say, which attempt to, to find, to, to work out the way to gain happiness in that respect as well, by curing, as it were, the deeper disorders of, the, of, 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 of our life, not just the merely physical ones. 
Some, therefore, I find that the way to do that is to, 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 to cultivate a relationship with uh, some kind of supreme being, God, if you like. And uh, by cultivating that relationship, they feel that this is what will, will, will deal with the deep existential problems of, of life, of life and death. Um, we in Buddhism, of course, take a slightly different type, a different approach. And this is where meditation will play such an important role. Because in the Buddhist point of view, the actual ultimate source of happiness and suffering is actually the mind. Neither the external world simply, nor an external being, a creator or a devil, neither of those. But it actually, the real cause of happiness and the real cause of suffering are lying in the mind itself. Uh, so it's like the mind is the basis. And if we don't look there, uh, then we will not find lasting happiness and lasting freedom from, from, from suffering. We may find partial and temporary solutions to our problems, but not the, the permanent solution. So we have to look into the mind. But how is it the mind is the source of happiness and suffering? Well, from a Buddhist point of view, it is, we could say it's really like this, that it is the mind that shapes the world, in fact, uh, because it is the motivations arising in the mind, whether good or bad, whether well-intentioned or, or evilly intentioned in, in short, whether based upon positive wholesome emotions like love and, and kindness and compassion, or whether based upon negative, destructive emotions like hatred and anger, that then those emotions, which are whichever are dominant in our mind, then shape our responses to the world, to others, our actions. And those actions performed uh, in, in an attempt to produce happiness do so if they're based upon, um, upon kindness and love and so on, but if they're based upon the selfish emotions of hatred and uh, anger and desire and so on, they inevitably lead us and others to suffering. So it is Buddhism. Uh, so in Buddhism, it is mind that goes the, before all things. It is mind because the mind that shapes our intentions, and our intentions lead to actions, and our actions are what produce either happiness or suffering, respectively. So it's, that's where we have to really look. That's where we have to really, as it were, solve the problem. Because whatever is arising in our mind creates our uh, experience of the world, our response to the world, our response to others. In fact, actually, in one Buddhist scripture, it says, mind is the king of all creators, meaning that even the very shape of the world, the way the world appears to us, what we see as the external world, that actually is arising finally from our mind itself. So as that's the case, then it is absolutely crucial that it, we look to the mind, that we look to, to discover the nature of our mind. Now, in fact, uh, uh, what Buddha said is that the nature of our mind, the nature of all beings' mind, is naturally pure. Is, is in itself and always has been from beginningless time, actually. It is naturally pure. It is naturally clear. It is naturally open like space. It is unceasing in its awareness. It possesses these, these intrinsic qualities, these primordial qualities of, of clarity, of openness and awareness. Yet, we do not recognize that. We do not recognize that, and therefore we do not dwell in it, and therefore we do not act out of it. Rather, it's as if our mind is clouded, as if our mind is clouded over, obscured. And so instead of understanding who and what we are, in the, in the sense of recognizing our true nature, that openness, clarity, and unceasing awareness that I just mentioned, which is our real, the real core of our being. Instead, we we identify with a kind of very shrunken uh, version, like in fact, what is the self, the self, the I, the me, 
that which it makes me feel separate from the rest of the world, makes me feel separate from and opposed to other. There's a fracture in our world because there's a fracture in our mind. It's a fracture that, as I say, is a, dual, is a dualism which opposes self to other. Because as soon as we start to think in this way, I am my, I am mine, I and me, we are split from the world. We are, in a way, behind walls that we've constructed in our imagination. And that essentially, that walling ourselves off from the rest of the world, from the rest of reality, in this fearful fiction of clinging to self, is the root of all our suffering. But we have to see through it because we're bewitched by this, this notion of, of self. We've come to believe that it's only if we affirm ourselves against others, if we privilege ourselves over others, this self which we mistakenly identify with our body or with temporary thoughts or temporary emotions, by identifying with that, we think we have a solidity and a security that will defend us. And we keep perpetuating this misidentification of who we are, what our mind truly is, from moment to moment, as we say in Dharma, from life to life. And because we constantly identify with this fictional self, then we are estranged from the world. And out of that estrangement, that fracture between us and others, come those poisonous emotions of aggression, of desire, of ignorance, and all the whole uh, uh, panoply of, uh, of negative emotions, which then, as I mentioned, stimulate us to act, act in desire to appropriate from the world what we think will make us feel secure, or act with aggression to free ourselves from that which we think challenges us and our fragile security. So we're wrapped up in the deepest kind of way in suffering, but it's a suffering that emerges from our mind in that we, we are, our mind is clouded by this, this kind of basic ignorance, this basic unawareness of its real nature. Yet at the same time, the mind is naturally pure, just like the sky. The, or the sky may be clouded over by all kinds of, of things, all kinds of clouds. Nevertheless, the sky retains always its natural, simple purity, its natural, simple openness. And so likewise, our mind, though it's clouded over by all these temporary thoughts and emotions which, which propel us into negative actions that propel us further into suffering and the cycle continually repeats in that way, Nevertheless, at any moment, we can actually, as it were, touch this, settle in, recognize and settle in this natural purity of, of mind, which Buddha called the Buddha nature, because it's like, what else is somebody who's awakened than somebody like him, he did? Merely somebody who's recognized the natural state and no longer identifies with the fictions of self and other the fictions of I and mine, somebody who has discovered their natural primordial freedom. And with that, their natural qualities of, of compassion. Because when, when we no longer are grasping in this dualistic way at me as against you, then I can respond with open-heartedness to the sufferings of others. An open-heartedness that was not possible as long as I, in my neurosis and fear, identified with this shrunk-down kind of homunculus, to my say, this monkey mind, instead of my real, natural, open mind. So compassion arises out of that ability to rest in and recognize one's natural mind. So that is why... Buddhism puts such emphasis on training the mind. So now on, and and the and to do this, core of that training is is meditation. But I need to make a caution here, like or, or to put a, a kind of yes, a little caveat, perhaps one might say, in at this point, because if one were to imagine 
oh, well, therefore, all I need is meditation. Well, the, the, the thing is that that's not quite so simple. You know, not quite so simple. Meditation alone will not really work very well. Uh, this, if, this kind of construction of the ego, of the self, the fiction of the self that we mentioned, is very, very tenacious. It has, it's been going on since the beginning of our life, and as we would say in Dharma, from beginningless lives. So merely learning a little bit of meditation, though it will help, is not going to dismantle it all at once. So we need to train in a wider way. Yes, the heart of the training is, is meditation, because meditation is nothing other than sitting in and stabilizing it, settling in and seeing the nature of mind. But we need some support, supporting structure for that. I can exp explain it in two ways. Like in the Dharma, in the Buddhist teachings, we talk about the necessity for hearing, thinking, and meditating. Hearing, thinking, and meditating. Lord Buddha himself said these are the three ways to wisdom. Why are the three ways to wisdom? What do they mean? Hearing means that very listening to uh, and absorbing the teachings, the instructions for all of us followers of the Buddha. Those instructions really are the ones that he delivered to his disciples and which have been transmitted down in the various Buddhist traditions to this day. Because this is the first way to overcome ignorance. Because our ignorance is great. Yes, we may possess Buddha nature, but we fabricated an entire kind of illusory universe for ourselves. And we've invested in that from life to from day to day, from life to life. So we are truly estranged from who we really are and what we really are. So first we need to dispel the gross forms of that ignorance, our mistaken views about the world, our prejudices, and so on. Because our ignorance is, is, has been elaborated in language and in, in concepts and in philosophies and so on and so forth, which we cling to to, to kind of have some secure, false security for ourselves. So we begin the process of dismantling that by listening to the teachings, the advice given by Buddha, where you know, essentially say, look at this, look at that, examine that, examine this. Isn't it the case, for instance, that what you've been clinging to as permanent is actually impermanent? Look at that, you'll see, and so on. So all the teachings of, of the Buddha are really wonderful advice for beginning the process of dismantling the machinery that locks us in suffering. Here, think and meditate. Well, myself, so the, what you're saying is just listen to or read the scriptures of the Buddha or the, and the great masters. No, it's not enough. We have to internalize them. And that means we have to, in a way, enter into dialogue with them. We have to critique them. We have to digest them by using our common sense and our analytical powers to see whether they're internally consistent, to see whether they make sense. Nobody's saved by faith alone in the Buddha Dharma. We have to understand the, the, the truth. Of, we have to gain certainty in the truth of Buddha's prescription. If he's like a doctor who's prescribing the way to, to be cured from a, the illness of suffering, we need to know his reliable this prescription is reliable that's the job of the analytical part the the thinking part so to speak then we meditate and so in this context it means meditate on that which you've heard and really digested through analysis because then through meditation you can make your actual own experience of this the wisdom the understanding you gain from hearing and thinking is great but it's still not as it were, yours, not entirely yours. It's only when you taste for yourself the truth of the teachings by looking into your mind that you, you gain uh, absolute uh, certainty, absolute certainty, a sense of direct experience. So hearing removes the general ignorance. Thinking removes the kind of ignorance of, 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 of doubt and uncertainty, and then you gain certain experience of the, the luminosity, the clear light of mind, as it said, by meditation. So that's where meditation 
fits in that context. So you can't meditate, therefore, without hearing and thinking. Just you'll be meditating on the basis of ignorance. And therefore, the mere, you know, one might say, well, I just sit cross-legged and, and, and just be quiet. Well, animals, I don't know about the cross-legged, but animals can be very quiet and very still in the winter when they hibernate. But they don't become enlightened by that. It's never been observed that they do. So just mere sitting without hearing thinking is not the way, according to Azindana. And then here's another way to, to put the context, the proper context for meditation. The Buddha prescribed three trainings, as the great master Nagarjuna says in the friendly letter. All the trainings of Buddha are grouped in the three trainings, which are moral discipline, meditation, and wisdom. So now we see. What does this mean? What this means is that unless we develop the ethical qualities that we will gain from practicing Buddha's advice on behavior, there's no, we won't have the space, so to speak, in our life to uh, cultivate attentiveness, the attentiveness which is the essence of meditation. A lifestyle based on selfishness and indulgence of others through physical and verbal means. Meditation just can't exist in that. You have to already kind of let go of that, to, as I say, to create the space in yourself, the emotional and mental space, to, to practice meditation. What's more, if one thought one could practice meditation and carry on with an abusive lifestyle in which you... you what are you doing? You're perpetuating the grossest forms of selfishness and spreading suffering rather than spreading goodness. So it's indispensable in Dharma that we have a good ethical basis upon which we then place the practice of, of meditation. And the essence of Buddhist ethics is to not harm any being, not harm any being. You see that? Fracture between self and others, that tragic fracture which we've, we've kind of bewitched ourselves by, that sees others as really objects which either I can exploit for my happiness or stand in the way of my happiness. And therefore, one's behavior is, is abusive physically and exploitative and so on and so forth. So the very first thing we've got to do is change that outer behavior to create the right environment for inner meditation. So uh, we must have that good basis of ethical teaching. And Buddha has discussed that in many places. And as I say, the essence of ethics is non-harmfulness, non-violence, but not just non-violence in terms of the physical violence, but also not stealing, no sexual misconduct, and so on and so on, no harmful, false and harmful speech, etc. You can check or you can look up all the, the details, of course. You know, probably know them anyway. Then meditate. So on the basis of ethics, then meditate. But then beyond meditation, there's wisdom in this triad. Morality, or ethics, if you like, meditation, wisdom. So what's going on there? Well, what's going on there is the, the point is being made that to really see into the heart of reality, to see the nature of the world as it really is, and the nature of the mind, we need the intermediary step of meditation. Because here meditation means stillness, the mind of one-pointedness, the mind of, that is, is settled within itself. If you like to use a modern analogy, like the microscope that is properly, properly adjusted so that then through the microscope you can look into the structure of whatever, the, the deep structure of whatever object you're examining. In this analogy, wisdom is the looking through the microscope. But if the microscope is not properly focused, you can't look through it and see anything true. So meditation is that indispensable tuning, uh, adjusting of the, the microscope of attention. That's its role here. Only with that can there be authentic wisdom. It's like without that, wisdom would just be opinions. Ideas about the world may be good, maybe not, may be correct, may be incorrect. But we wouldn't know them for ourselves. We wouldn't have experienced them directly, and therefore we wouldn't be liberated from the cause of our suffering by them. So meditation is essential in, in preparing the ground for wisdom. So from this, this kind of short 
illustration, I wanted to show how where meditation is in Buddhism, what is its what is its role in terms of uh, the first that it, it's hearing, thinking, meditating, and second that is medit it's morality or ethics, meditation, wisdom. Now. Having done that, so to clear up any kind of possibility of, 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 of a kind of mistaken approach to meditation. Uh, I mean, this is the Buddhist approach to meditation. I should say, of course, types of meditation exist, of course, in, in different religious systems, different philosophical systems, it, not only in Buddhism. But this is a Buddhist approach, which, which I'm, I'm kind of uh, uh, summarizing here. Now... Therefore, let me say a little bit more than about the procedure or the, the structure of meditation, perhaps, in, in Buddhism. So that if you are newly embarked upon it, you'll have some idea of, of where, where it's leading to, of what it, what, what, what's next, so to speak. Um, or if you've been experienced for some time, then it's just to, to repeat the, the things that you already know, but maybe therefore bring a bit more clarity to it. So it's like this. In the general Dharma, in the general teaching, uh, we say that meditation is twofold. Uh, and that is, I mean, I should acknowledge there's many types of meditation, even in Buddhism. But at the heart of the Buddhist system of meditation, there are two points, two phases. The first is called shamatha in Sanskrit, calm abiding in English. And the second is in Sanskrit, vipassana, or insight in English. Now, there's some difference of opinion about that, particularly nowadays, but generally within our tradition, that is to say within the, the, the Tibetan traditions like the Kaju and Sakya and Gelug and Nyingma, uh, and I think even wider in, in other Mahayana traditions, Traditions too. It is taught that that you need both of these aspects of meditation, shamatha, calm abiding, and insight. And moreover, that calm abiding is usually necessary first. That's a sequence. First calm abiding, then insight. And then one can unite the two. But anyway, that is the general order. Shamatha, then vipassana. In a way I've already talked about, without spelling it out uh, precisely, why it's that order of first calm abiding and then insight. You see, like, uh, and that it is that order, you know, for instance, is, 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 is mentioned by the great Buddhist master, in the 7th century Indian Buddhist master, Shantideva. He said that uh, 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 knowing that, uh, recognizing that the disturbing emotions which obscure my mind uh, are overcome by insight that has been combined with calm abiding, I should first of all practice calm abiding. So in other words, we will need both of these aspects of meditation, calm abiding and insight, if we're to really free our mind from those obscurations of ignorance and disturbing emotions, which are the cause of all our sufferings. But one might therefore say, oh, well, if insight's a decisive one, why don't you just go straight to that? But in fact, no, we need, first of all, to have calm abiding. And that takes us back to that analogy I used before about the, the microscope needing to be, to be focused. So first, calm abiding. What is calm abiding? How do we define that in Dhamma? Calm abiding is the mind, is defined as the mind resting undivided in itself both one-pointed and evenly settled. We can understand the significance of those words when we think about the normal condition of our mind right now. Normal condition of our mind right now is that it's agitated, that it's stirred up continuously by emotions arising and by different chains of thought arising, by labeling this, thinking about that, dreaming of that, Remembering this, our mind is anywhere other than in the present moment, anywhere other than settled, one-pointedly and evenly right now. 
So our mind is not able to see anything as it really is. It's not able to see reality as it is. And it's certainly not able to look into its own depth, its own core, its own real nature. It's chasing here and there like some kind of crazy monkey jumping from tree to tree. So the task of shamatha, the first stage in meditation, is to calm that monkey mind by bringing him or her, could be female monkey, you never know, into the present moment. That's it. That's really the core of shamatha, is to bring the mind back, as it were, to, it, to itself. Now, one might think, oh, that means like suppressing thought, suppressing emotions and achieving some kind of dead state of mind. No, that's not true. When calmness of mind is really achieved, when shamatha is really achieved, the mind is light and spacious, but it is calm and unruffled. So it's not dead, it is clear and calm simultaneously, like a body of water, perhaps the ocean, which has come to peace, but in which one can see what is contained in the ocean clearly. That is the real characteristic of the of the shamatha mind, both, both calm and clear. This is very important, especially for beginners to shamatha to understand, because the temptation is to think, well, right now I have many thoughts, right now I have many wandering thoughts and emotions, therefore what I need to do is like subdue them all and like beat them to death by, the, by very strong concentration. That will produce some effects that one might think initially one is becoming calm, but actually it's creating a real, rig a real tension, a rigidity and a tension, which will lead, in fact, to further kind of fracture in, in one's mind and further suffering and, and, yes, ignorance. So that's not the way. The way of shamatha is a, a gentle way, one that, that is, as it were, works with the thoughts and emotions and gradually leads them to be tamed. And so the mind then becomes pliable, flexible, clear and calm, as I said. To practice shamatha, it might be possible that we didn't need any object at all. We could simply bring the mind back again and again to the present moment until it kind of, in a way, fuses with the present moment. It rests in oneness with each moment that arises. But generally, most people find it very difficult, at least initially, to not have something to focus on. So the formless meditation is difficult for, for beginners. But, but, it's, it's, but if one can do it, that's, that's great. And there the only instruction in a way is simply, the only focus is bringing the mind back to the present moment and resting in oneness with it. Neither thinking about the future, or remembering the past, nor even trying to grasp at the present, but just rest in oneness with it. This is the, in a way, the, the most wonderful and subtle instruction for calm abiding. But like I say, generally, it's, you know, that practice is almost like too simple, too subtle for us. So therefore, we probably, to begin with at least, or maybe for some time, we need an object to focus upon. What kind of object? Well, for sure, not one that stimulates our disturbing emotions. <laughs> so, so though the mind might be fascinated to look at some alluring picture, or equally stunned by looking at something fearful, that's not good, because that just cultivates more desire, more, or more fear, more aggression. So no. Something that, however, it's, it's an object that has to be uh, at least not, not non-virtuous, neutral, but even nicer sometimes if it has a kind of positive uh, context to it, like looking at a Buddha image, for instance. We can use objects for different senses that relate to different senses. So if you like visual images to, to, to serve as your focus for meditation, the thing you bring your mind back to, you can, as I just mentioned, you can use a Buddha image. But if that was too complex, you could use a blue flower. Like a paper flower that is, is blue in color, then you use that as the visual referent, and you practice the meditation, beginning with settling the mind on the object, 
then continuing that placing or settling on the object when the mind wanders because of a thought or emotion, gently bringing it back and proceeding in that way. Actually, if I was to detail it, there'd be nine points to make about this, the settling the mind on, a, on the object. But settling, continuing to settle, and resettling when the mind is wandering is a good place to start the process of meditation. So a visual object might work for some people, but for others, even that might be a little bit too fussy or a little bit too complex or enhance a kind of sense of, of se separation between oneself and the object. So for them, then maybe meditating on the breath as we did ourselves, meditating on the flow of the breath by, by counting it. That might be the best object. I should traditionally said that this is a particularly good shamatha object for people who conceptualize too much. And <laughs> one might say, as Tibet has actually observed quite a lot, this is particularly <laughs> something that we're very prone to in the West. We kind of, we, we're obsessed with our thinking and our thoughts and our labeling. And uh, so that's why it seems like for many people nowadays, the, 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 object, the focusing on the breath is a good basis for shamatha practice. But it might not be. So one should perhaps try out a, a few different techniques. I introduced the technique of just following and counting the breath. That's really kind of preliminary access type of stuff to preliminary access to shamatha type of stuff. But it had that same characteristic, placing, continuing to place, and then replacing or resettling when the mind wanders. Of course, I didn't even bother to talk about the physical posture for meditation, but that's really important because although the mind is core, the mind is, of course, right now in the body. And if the body is not in a kind of appropriate type of posture for meditation, then it's as if the currents of energy on which the mind, we think, rides are not settled and they will produce further agitation for the mind. But if the body is in the right position, the position you can observe in Buddha statues, for instance, the meditative position, which we sometimes call the posture of Buddha Vairochana, then all the energies will flow naturally in the right way in our body. And then our vision will be right, the way we uh, look. And then our mind will be calmer. So even just through the posture, there's great benefit for, for meditation. Body and vision then the mind follows that. And as regards the vision, even if we're doing the concentration and breathing, generally it's good to not to have the eyes closed. If you have some problem with vision, for instance, your eyes become full of tears very easily, then you could close them. But generally we say the vision should be that the eyes are neither wide open nor closed, but just gently resting. And gently resting on a place that is aligned with the tip of our nose. So not downwards too much, not wide up, but just slightly downwards. For shamatha at the beginning, that is exactly the best, the best gaze, the best line of vision. So with the right posture and the right vision, we're already halfway to, to a good shamatha practice. And then we take the object, like for instance, the, the counting, the, the breathing. And as I mentioned at the very beginning, of course, thoughts and emotions will arise. The unwary, the naive meditator may see them as the enemy because isn't it that they are the enemy? Isn't agitation of our mind what is causes us not to rest in its true nature? Yes, that's true. But you, you can't beat them into submission. It's not really, as a, it, it, rather they, as I say, they must be tamed gently. And that way we, we begin to heal the fracture in our mind. So when in a meditation session, which, by the way, for beginners should be short and repeated frequently, in that meditation session, when emotions or thoughts arise and distract you from the object, the counting or whatever it is, gently bring the mind back, place it again on the object, relax it on the object <clears throat> and remain there. And if a thought comes, and takes you away again, gently bring back, place, and when you place the mind back on the object, by the way, not tensely, not with kind of tightness, 
place and then kind of in a way slightly relax. That's the way. So it's like the mind must always have room to breathe, so to speak, not be tense and tightly held. That will produce resistance and, and in the long run make the thoughts more wild and more un, untamed. So that is the procedure. By practicing this type of shabata frequently, once a day if possible, it would be very good if you can keep it up every day, but not for too long. Beginners shouldn't practice too long. They should quit when the mind still feels quite fresh. If you exhaust the mind in shamatha, it's reluctant to practice again. So no, fr frequent but sure. Anyway, by practicing this way, but not being anxious about success and not being uh, upset when, for instance, one day the meditation is good, but the next day it's a little too choppy, too many thoughts. Don't worry about that. So, but by getting rid of too much ambition and too much kind of calculating how it's going, gradually, gradually, it will start, qualities will start to arise by themselves in the practice. And what that means is that the thoughts will lessen in intensity. It's often said that the first stage of kind of success in shamatha is like realizing your mind is like the water in a mountain waterfall, which is just rushing and rushing and rushing down. It doesn't seem like success. But actually, you see, the thing is that ordinary people, I'd say people not used to meditation, usually think their mind is quite controlled. But when we start to meditate, we realize to our kind of shock and dismay usually, our mind is utterly not controlled. And it is indeed like that mountain waterfall. So recognizing that is actually success. So we gently persist. And as we gently persist, the waterfall begins to tame. The water becomes more like the, the water in a maybe a mountain stream, still forceful, still rushing, but not so much. And then gradually it's like as the stream is descending, it starts to kind of tire, so to speak. The force of the current is less. Similar with our meditation, as we gently persist in the practice, the thoughts and emotions start to tire themselves. And as they, they're still arising, seeming to be some force, but then you start to notice the gaps are occurring, little kind of pauses, little moments where actually there's no thought or emotion kind of arising to, 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 to us. There's a moment of stillness instead. Now, of course, that is where we then start, we will likely to think, oh, that's it then, that is really meditation. It's not actually, because what we could be tempted to do there was think the way to progress is to to produce more and more of these moments of stillness. And you can't produce them because they just naturally arise. And in fact, the stillness is all very well, but what about the thoughts? The thoughts have to, and the stillness have to be integrated. That is a subject for deeper meditation instruction, in fact. So I don't need to say much about it now. But just that point, for beginners, don't, Treat your thoughts or emotions as the enemy to be suppressed or destroyed or eliminated. They're not really that. And we, when we start to experience shamatha, the real qualities of shamatha properly, we'll be ready to understand that. And that eventually will lead us to vipassana, to insight, where we really start to understand exactly what is the base of both stillness and moving thought. And through that, then we start to approach those that real core of the mind, the clear, uh, open, unceasing awareness, the Buddha nature, in fact. But that is, as they say, a subject for another day, or perhaps many other days. So I think uh, that's pretty much uh, enough uh, meditation for now, uh, talking about meditation. But let's do something with our turbulent minds in these turbulent times right now by doing a little bit more meditation. So again, if you want to, you can do the counting of the breath or whatever meditation practice you're familiar with. <clears throat> 
Badan sawe amar boje dagi jigo bene dice kadi tempo gene jesonde kusun tu che no do sando
Okay. So I'd just like to say in closing that uh, once again, I'm so sorry I was not able to come to bring in to your beautiful city, to see the beautiful lake and to be with you all. But I'm very uh, inspired that Claudia and the rest of the team, you're working so hard for Bodhipath uh, in Bregenz. And um, anyway, I, I'm including Bregenz in my plans for, for next year. So I really hope we'll be meeting together directly and practicing and sharing the Dharma together in that, uh, in that way. So until I, until I see you directly, then uh, stay well and uh, happy. And uh, yes, enjoy a little meditation. And uh, in that way, you'll see right through these turbulent times. Okay. So let us close with a dedication of merit that through whatever goodness we've made through sharing the Dharma together, that all beings will be freed from the sufferings of birth, old age, sickness, and death. So now I'm the Tanshi Zikvan, a Tobi Nepe Panad. Chiga Nati Bala, Drupai, Sipi Sole, Drova, Drova, Shu, Tumba, Jikta, and Kamsu, Chambada, and Tumba, Nia, Shindu, Soai, Tenzin Bula, Gindan, Tumbe, Tempe, Yangri, Nepe, Taishi, Shu.